Welcome to the Functional Medicine Radio Show with your host, Dr. Carrie Drizga, known internationally as the Functional Medicine Doc. Dr. Carrie is committed to helping patients find the root cause of their health problems and fixing the cause with natural treatments so they can feel normal again. Dr. Carrie is the founder of Functional Medicine Ontario and is the author of the hit book, Reclaim Your Energy and Feel Normal Again. Please welcome your host, Dr. Carrie Drizga. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Functional Medicine Radio Show, the only Internet radio show dedicated to giving you real solutions to improve your health. Not only are they real solutions, but they're natural solutions as well. Because, as you know, the one and only true wealth you have is your health. I'm your host, Dr. Carrie Drizga, the Functional Medicine Doc, and I'm committed to helping you find the root cause of your health problem, fix the cause with natural treatments so you can feel normal again and live your life to the fullest. Today's topic is the healthy workplace. I'm so very excited about today's show because my special guest is Lee Stringer. Let me tell you a little bit about her. Lee is a workplace strategy expert and researcher. She works for an architecture, engineering, and building technology firm. She is the author of two best-selling books, The Green Workplace, Sustainable Strategies That Benefit Employees, The Environment, and the Bottom Line, and The Healthy Workplace, How to Improve the Well-Being of Your Employees and Boost Your Company's Bottom Line. Lee is currently collaborating with Harvard University's School of Public Health to create new tools to connect like minds and to blur the boundaries across industries in order to ad advance and improve our well-being at work. Lee, thank you so much for being my special guest today on this episode of the Functional Medicine Radio Show. Oh, thanks so much for having me. So, Lee, can you first kind of talk about what are some of the problems that you see in our, our workplace? You know, uh, the pretty obvious ones are that most of us, uh, of course, you know, lots of people work in lots of different settings, but a good majority of us are sitting and staring at devices most of the day. Um, we're not moving around. We're not, uh, we're eating at our desk and um, <clears throat> dribbling all kinds of, you know, bits of things in our keyboard and, and not taking a mental break. Um, and we're not, um, we're not sleeping well, and there's this whole uh, cycle that we're getting into um, because we're focused on our knowledge work. We're doing everything that we're supposed to be doing. We're working really, really hard, but it's not uh, in service. It's not really um, how our minds and bodies were made. We're in conflict all the time. So uh, there are all kinds of chronic issues, which I'm sure you talk about or you've talked about before, um, that we're all facing. And so the issue um, for, for all of us is to rethink how we work. And uh, it's not that our work needs to change so much, but the way that we do it uh, should. So before we dive into all of those juicy nuggets that you're going to give us today, what are some of the... What's some of the research showing about these detriments about us, you know, sitting so much and spending so much time at a desk, being sedentary, et cetera? What, what have you found? Oh, my gosh. Well, I mean, it's, it's really um, – so interestingly, I think one of the, the easy uh, answers is, is one that's well published, which is sitting uh, for long periods of time. It's like the new smoking – it's uh, causing all sorts of um, uh, cardiometabolic issues and um, eventually obesity in a lot of folks um, because we're not moving. There are also um, interesting studies that show that um, there's an increase in deep vein thrombosis um, from sitting large uh, periods of time. And um, I used to remember people used to get that from travel, from traveling overseas quite a bit and sitting and not wearing those good socks and standing up and moving around. But now it's just our work that is causing uh, things like that. And um, the obesity epidemic continues to grow, and it's like this self-perpetuating thing. You know, it's it's harder to move um, when you're when you're more overweight, and um, it makes it you know even more difficult for us to do the things that we need to do um, to again um, improve our cardiometabolic health. And so, what are your thoughts about how to rethink our workday? Well, there are. A few categories I, I like to um, put things in. One is around movement, um, standing up more and moving more. Another is around food. Um, another is around stress reduction, which is, is pretty key, I think, for a lot of us. And one is about uh, sleep 
uh, ways that we can actually improve our sleep at night by activities and, and, um, and strategies that we can adopt during the day. Okay, so then let's, let's just first start with movement and talk about that. Like, we'll go through all four of these. Okay. And because uh, I agree with you, I, I love that you have these four because they are, they are key. So let's start with movement. Okay. Well, movement um, needs to happen regularly. Uh, you can't just save it for the weekend, um, which I used to do a lot. Um, being a weekend warrior, kind of um, save all my working out and, and uh, getting stuff done. Um, it doesn't work uh, to put all that exercise off until the end of the end of the week. Uh, number one, you can't fit it in, and number two, it causes all kinds of injury, um, and typically uh, typically does. So the idea is um, standing every thirty minutes or so, and moving every hour, hour and a half or so. Um, that is the ideal, you know, kind of regularly during the day. And then exercise is really, really important. And I'm a mom. I am a busy lady, working lady. And I know what it's like when it's, you know, well, i got to take care of my kids. don't really have time to exercise. I'll just put that off. Um, it really, really makes a huge difference in our health uh, by exercising regularly during the week. And there are all kinds of data points that say that we need to be exercising 150 minutes a week, which translates into five times a week, 30 minutes, you know, if, if that's how you want to break it down. But um, that is uh, one of the hardest thing, I think, for, for a lot of folks that I know anyway, to uh, make time for exercise and make time for, for getting up and moving around regularly. So you said the importance of standing every 30 minutes and moving mm -hmm. every hour and a half. And working out every day if you can make it. <laughs> Maybe every other day. Um, yeah, and um, so ways to do that. Uh, a lot of people get these sit sitting to standing desks, um, which seem to be coming down in price, but ever so slowly. <laughs> yes. I wish they went a little faster. Um, and there are all kinds of ways to hacks for that, though. You know, you can um, you can either you know put books on your desk and put your laptop on top, or depending on your setup, um, a lot of people will um, just move around. Like I work at home a lot, and my kitchen table, I'll just move my laptop to my kitchen table and stand. And then when I get tired, go back to my desk. So um, there are ways of kind of controlling that um, without needing a fancy uh, piece of furniture. Yeah, and then I, then I was thinking too of just reminders, how to set a reminder. Like, mm -hmm. it's time for you to stand up. Sure, you can do it on your laptop or your computer. You can do it on your, if you're a Fitbit fanatic, uh, you can do that too, um, or, or, you know, have a wearable. I think there are, yeah, these, these constant reminders are really good. And um, sometimes I notice uh, that I'll kind of uh, measure myself in fits and starts. So I'll kind of get obsessed, like, how many steps did I make today? And was I moving around and standing? And I'll, I'll put on a wearable and measure myself for two or three months. Um, compare myself to all my friends and family, of course, which is healthy competition, um, and then and colleagues. And then I will um, kind of, you know, forget about it for a while. But it's good to go back and continue to measure um, measure yourself because, you know, the old adage, you, you don't manage uh, what you don't measure. And um, I think that's it's good to be aware also that uh, there's all these uh, statistics out there about how many steps you should be taking. That's a, certainly a good metric. Um, but it varies based on age and, uh, you know, if you have a chronic condition or not. You have to be kind to yourself and look at reasonable metrics. But 10,000 steps a day is a good, a, good, a good place if you're a healthy adult. And then the other thing you mentioned was make sure to move every hour and a half. Right. So that, again, you might have your little timer um, to remind you to do that. And also just build in your day um, opportunities to move. I think... Um, you know, we're addicted to these these uh, mobile phones and devices. Well, let's use it for good and do um, walking conference calls. If you don't have to look at a presentation on your phone and you're just having a chat with someone, do it while walking or pacing. Um, go outside uh, if you can get away with that. It's um, it's really one of those things where I'll, I'll sometimes look at my day and, and think about what can I carve out that, you know, number one, can I go outside? Number two, can I do it while moving? Um, and uh, Or number three, do it while standing up. And surprisingly, there are a lot of things that you can do um, with a, a few adjustments. Okay, fantastic. So now let's transition to the food aspect. So you're saying a lot of people get caught up in their workday. They end up eating lunch at their desk. Right. <laughs> 
This gets into, um, you know, and I'm, I'm the worst. I'm, I'm really working at this one. It's one of the hardest things, I think, to, to pull away from. You know, you're doing work, and we all have this mindset that I'm more productive if I just work through lunch or, you know, eat um, while working. But it's so important to pull away and be mindful of what you're eating. We shovel more in our face um, when we're not paying attention than if we are. Um, and it's also an opportunity, I think, um, if we're, we're working to, if you work at home, maybe it's a, it's a call with someone else. You know, if you need an excuse to pull yourself away from your screen, maybe it's a call or meeting a friend or a colleague. Um, uh, you know, if you work in, a, in an office space, just, just again, meeting someone um, for lunch or having a place where you and your team regularly go to eat. That practice is really, really good for making connections um, and getting to know your colleagues better as well as um, being more mindful. There are other things on the nutrition front, oh, so much, um, that's really happening now. There's a lot of um, focus now on choice architecture. And I don't know if your, your listeners would be familiar with that term, but it's um, this idea that the way food is presented to us greatly impacts what we eat and how much we eat. Um, and companies are really starting to pay attention uh, on this in terms of, you know, if, if you work for a big company in a, like a cafeteria setting, putting those healthy foods up front or right by the checkout counter, having healthy bars or healthy smoothies or other things like that right at the checkout counter where we spend a lot of time looking <laughs> and waiting in lines. And um, that it's uh, the other, you know, other interesting trick that I've seen some companies use is uh, refrigerators in the break room with a glass door. Um, which a lot of healthy foods, uh, foods that have a short shelf life, tend to need to be refrigerated. Um, they also tend to be the more healthy foods like eggs or, um, you know, milk or other uh, tuna, you know, like whatever it is that um, uh, people are either bringing in or the company decides to provide um, for folks. Uh, having that a refrigerator that you can see through makes a big difference versus um, not being able to see through it because we'll tend to grab the things that have a really long shelf life like popcorn or chips or whatever that's sitting out there on the counter and can, you know, doesn't have to be um, put in a fridge. So um, it's kind of interesting, this, this shift that's happening. But uh, buying a fridge, not so cheap. <laughs> but uh, if you are renovating your office, it's something to look at. Yeah, you know, you mentioned that one thing, buying a refrigerator that you can see into, and I can definitely see the benefit of that. It's, it's so interesting. Just you saying that is like, that makes so much sense. Yeah, so some of these really sporty spice, super healthy companies are, are doing it, and they see, um, they see a big difference. And also just hiding in a counter, um, putting things away, those things which are not so healthy. I don't know if... Uh, if your listeners are familiar with the Google, um, what is they go the Google 15 or Google 20? So a lot of Google employees way back when used to gain a lot of weight that first year because there were all these healthy snacks sitting out for them at all times, including big glass kind of columns of M&Ms and unhealthy foods. And so what Google started doing, um, this is another trick um, that works just well at home uh, as well, is to put food in a glass bowl and something clear um, and then put not so healthy foods, either put them in the fridge or cabinet and or put them in something translucent. You can't really see through that well. So Google will put nuts and um, dried fruits and things like that and clear vessels, and then their M&Ms, they'll hide. Um, it's still accessible. You can still get them in a pinch, but um, they're not as easy to find, and that's certainly helped them. Okay, fantastic. So now let's transition to the stress reduction part because I think all of us could use a little bit more stress reduction. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Um, I've been speaking a, a lot on this issue and kind of comparing all these things. I'll put a lot of these strategies out to an you know, audience and they always, I always you know, ask people to raise their hand. Um, which do you think has impacted your productivity and or your, um, you know, your ability to do your best work? Is it a physical ailment or is it stress and anxiety? And two to three times the number of people will raise their hand when it comes to stress and anxiety. It really is um, very much part of our um, part of our life today, and we really need to find some ways to wrestle with it. 
um, a lot of times are, I mean, it's crazy because here we are, you know, we're not having to hunt for our food. <laughs> Life has never been better, right? We're able to sit at a nice, comfy, air-conditioned desk and, you know, um, work in a way that's completely easy, you know, by historical standards, and yet um, we're more stressed out than we ever have been. And a lot of that has to do with the movement factor, that we aren't moving around very much, and there's this mind-body connection, uh, of course, that's um, so important. But uh, I think the big the big thing with stress reduction is is number one movement, um, and number two finding ways to mentally kind of restore yourself um, through your work setting, and you can do that. Uh, there's this this new very uh, trendy topic. You'll sound really cool at parties if you throw this out, but this um, this term biophilia is really taking off, and that is. Um, it's a term that it really refers to our preference as humans to be in and among nature. And the more that we can put plants or fake plants or landscapes or anything that looks like an outdoor environment and bring the outside in, the more likely uh, we will be psychologically restored by looking at those things. So interesting. All these studies have come out that show people working at you know work settings and if you turn away from your screen for just two seconds and look at a plant, even a fake plant, it somehow restores us psychologically and and uh, let's just take a little breath and then we can get back at our task. Um, and I think having having those things available in as many places as we can is really important. Um, another fun factoid, I was talking with an environmental psychologist who was saying that um, really uh, are looking at wood, particularly a wood grain, anything that looks like a natural material. Um, in addition to plants, you, know, you can use all kinds of um, materials, but wood in particular um, non-painted wood um, where you can see the grain and it looks uh, like the natural wood is another restorative uh, element in our environment and rooms that have 43% or more of surfaces covered in natural materials are more psychologically restorative than those that are not. That's apparently some tipping point <laughs> in, uh, in her research so that was fascinating but, but I think um, again just paying attention so much of our our workplace is just really ugly. Let me just go there. I mean, these cubicles, ugh, they're just, I'm an architect, you know, I should know better. We, should, we need to, we need to kind of, I think, raise the bar in terms of our environments um, and not make them so sterile and turn them into places that are beautiful, that restore us and, and keep us calm throughout the day. That's so fantastic what you said about plants and that that even works with fake plants. So even if you are in a cubicle, and you don't have natural light, you could get a fake plant, and that would be helpful. Absolutely. Um, another uh, trick, so fake plants, by the way, on sale at Ikea. <laughs> I was just there the other day. I'm like, oh, my gosh, these are beautiful, um, really affordable. And, um, yeah, as many of them as you uh, can stand, uh, talk with your neighbors. Maybe you guys could coordinate a little um, a little uh, happy zen room or, uh, you know, in a conference room or, or just, you know, having one at your desk is, is plenty good. Um, the other thing that is coming up, and this kind of feeds into our maybe our sleep discussion a little bit, but there's a lot of science hitting the ground now around um, circadian lighting. So this is lighting that really pays attention to our circadian rhythm, um, which has to do with our sleep patterns. And so certain kinds of light bulbs um, are will trigger in the back of our eye uh, wakefulness. There's this little nerve in the back, the SCN. I've forgotten what it stands for. It's a very long name. Um, but it basically triggers um, a nerve in the back of your eye that tells you to stop producing melatonin and wake up. And there's another light that actually sends out a different frequency that actually encourages your body to start producing melatonin and telling you it's bedtime. And they're little, you can literally buy a light bulb. You can put it on the you know, task light by your desk or uh, maybe by your bed uh, at night to sleep. And um, these are you know, produced by Philips and GE and Lighting Science. There's a lot of producers of them now. Um, for and this is you know really for you at your individual setting, but a lot of companies are actually looking at circadian lighting and putting it throughout the workplace, because um, what it does it actually changes through the day. It isn't just you know keeping you awake like it's 10 a.m. all day. It'll start to shift over time, um, and this really really helps our our sleep cycle. And then aren't there also things that you can download onto your for your computer screen, your your tablet, your iPhone? to also kind of mimic that circadian lighting? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can't remember the name of it. Something Lux. Um, and I, I haven't been using that as much because, frankly, a better solution <laughs> is to get outside. That's true. So a lot yeah. of sleep scientists will say, um, if you can get outside as much as possible, but particularly in the morning, um, for 30 minutes, up to two hours would be amazing to help your body reset itself. Nothing beats the sun. Um, and as much as we love these awesome circadian light bulbs and systems, they're great, but and, and they work really, really well. But I think being outside, uh, you know, Mother Nature, once again, um, is really good at that. So, you know, if it's taking your morning coffee outside or, um, you know, walking to work or parking a little further away and walking a little longer, if you can be outside for a little bit longer um, before you start your day, that's really, really helpful and I think um, a lot more effective than um, the things that, um, you know, uh, turn red or, you know, changes color um, at the end of the night. I think another, a better practice also is just to shut the thing off. <laughs> it's really hard to do. But um, if you send out emails regularly late at night, people will send you emails regularly late at night, and you're keeping up all your colleagues, too. So it's good practice to pick a time, 7 p.m., 8 p.m., whatever works for you and your team, but to, to shut it off um, and uh, start the bedtime ritual. Okay, so let's talk about then sleep. Let's, let's talk about that more. All right. So sleep is so foundational to health and productivity, and we don't pay attention to it at all, and it's kind of frightening <laughs> how, um, how we're working all kinds of crazy hours and not even realizing how we're impacting our sleep. Um, Ariane Huffington has come out in, with all kinds of books and, um, and statements about how sleep is really lack of sleep really negatively impacted her life, and um, she's on a war path, I think, to uh, help the rest of us on the planet. I think it's great. Um, the thing about sleep is that we don't give it the credit it's due, and it's the most important part of our health plan. And I think we are fall victim to the addictiveness of our devices and lots of other things. Um, and so the thing is around, you know, productivity, it's, it's interesting. We just did a study um, uh, with Harvard uh, the, uh, doing a, they have a health and human performance index, which measures organizational performance. And um, I've been piloting it. It looks at engagement and productivity and culture and the built environment, a whole bunch of things. And we used um, the survey to kind of measure um, the uh, organizational health and well-being of my own company. And we learned that there was this direct correlation between the number of uh, work hours that people were putting in on their timesheets, um, which is some, a data point we looked at, as well as commute time and um, lack of sleep. There was also, uh, so commute time, This we found actually found the average commute each way, and we're in some really small cities, the average commute was one hour each way. I thought that was wow. amazing. Um, I'm not sure, <laughs> maybe, you know, part of it's people are choosing to live in, in beautiful suburbs, which I, I think is great, but it does have an impact on our sleep and we have to be aware of it. So we've talked as a company like, oh, okay, so the solution is to, you know, make sure we level set workload, but also pay attention to commute time and maybe we allow more flexibility about how, when, and where our staff can work so that they don't, you know, they can work at home if they so choose. Um, let's make sure the technology works and that, you know, teams are comfortable with this. But, boy, this sure would help, you know, our staff sleep better, which is so, so important. I could go on and on. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a big deal. So, Lee, so far you've given us a lot of great information, talking about movement, making sure we stand every 30 minutes, move every hour and a half, you know, exercise more than just our weekend warrior, you know, right. get, get it during the week, uh, making healthier food choices, even putting, you know, the healthy foods in a clear bowl so that, you know, they look more appealing and putting those unhealthy things in a cabinet. You talked about stress reduction, having plants, even fake plants, and there's some beautiful fake plants these days, natural wood and whatnot, and then um, getting better sleep, getting natural light hitting your face. Do you think all of this would help us avoid the dreaded afternoon energy crash, or and do you have anything else that you can help us, you know, to, because I hear that so much from patients. 
um, that they get that mid-afternoon energy crash, then they go and they grab chocolate right. or chips uh, or a coffee or a Coke or whatever. Well, a couple, a couple strategies for that. One is um, the best defense is a really good offense. You're going to be hungry in the afternoon because we are naturally hungry. Um, I did some work with the Human Performance Institute in Orlando, and they train top athletes and, and in maximizing performance and all this kind of stuff. And they, they always say that um, really you need to have snacks available to you, you know, 100, 150 calories, not too big, but every two to four hours um, be prepared and have those in your purse, in your desk, somewhere. It's, you know, a handful of nuts, um, could be some yogurt could be a healthy bar, but have something so that you're prepared. Um, and Because uh, otherwise you will be hungry and you will absolutely, your body needs something. So you're going to go grab something in the vending machine or wherever. Um, I think the other thing that is important to think about is napping um, and consider it. Uh, your body's probably tired, and it could be that you didn't sleep well the night before, um, or and or that you're just, for whatever reason, you just are a little wiped out. Um, a lot of times what we do is very mentally taxing. <laughs> we need to just rest for a little bit. Our brains eat a lot of energy, eat a lot of, you know, those calories um, that we're burning off. And um, so having, um, you know, whether you're using a lactation room or a, a small area in the office that's quiet and dark, and you can just put your head down for a little bit on a... Um, a lounge chair or a bed or a sofa or whatever is available. I think that's really, really helpful to have that. A lot of companies are are adjusting that head on because, and everyone's different. I think it's it's unfair to say, hey, you know, I can't nap, so I don't think anyone else needs to nap. Well, you know what? Everyone's a little bit different, and they've had a different day than you had the day before. So um, just uh, providing that as an option. One thing about napping, um, really, the nap shouldn't be more than um, 20 minutes. And that includes kind of a 10-minute, or that, that doesn't include a 10-minute rant down where you kind of ah, relax and kind of sink into your nap. And then, and then once you're kind of um, in a relaxed state uh, for 20 minutes. Uh, more than that, and your sleep cycle, you're much more into a stage 3 and 4 sleep cycle, which means you're really groggy. It's really going to be hard to wake up after that. Fantastic. Lee, there's so much great information that you gave our listeners today. Is there anything else that we did not touch on that you think would be important for us to know? Well, I think that a lot of folks, um, myself included, I think uh, fight this idea of being healthy because it's because of culture, because of organizational culture. You know, oh, well, if I stand up, my team's going to look at me funny or, you know, I'm... If I walk around, my boss is going to think, you know, take a conference call that way, my boss is going to think I'm not working um, or that I'm goofing off. And I think as a, as a team, you know, we have to rally and be aware of this and support each other to work in different ways. And that sitting at your desk for eight hours a day, crow magnon style <laughs> on store of a computer is not healthy and it's actually not the most productive way to work. And I think that's a really hard thing for us to pull ourselves out of. Um, so, uh, and if you're, if you manage others, you are, people are watching you. So make some first moves. You're going to have to make those first moves. You're going to have to actually start changing your, your behavior first for your team to feel comfortable to do so. And that requires leadership and a little research on your part. Lee, how can our listeners find out more about you? And can you mention your two books again? So the green workplace and my latest book is the healthy workplace. Um, available wherever books are sold. And um, you can find me at leestringer.com. That's L-E-I-G-H, Stringer, like it sounds, dot com. And what I try and do there is link up the latest articles on all things health and wellness, um, interview uh, really interesting folks uh, talking about the latest research, and, and uh, you can connect with me there very easily. Fantastic. Lee, thank you so much for being my special guest today. This has been an awesome interview. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Dr. Gary. All right, that wraps up this very special episode of the Functional Medicine Radio Show with Lee Stringer. And I want to thank you, our listeners, for tuning in today. And I'd like to invite you back next time for another episode of the Functional Medicine Radio Show. As always, I'm your host, Dr. Gary Drizga, the Functional Medicine Doc. Have a great week, everyone. You've been listening to the Functional Medicine Radio Show with your host, Dr. Carrie Drizga, known internationally as the Functional Medicine Doc. 
Dr. Carey is committed to helping patients find the root cause of their health problems and fixing the cause with natural treatments so they can feel normal again. Dr. Carey is the founder of Functional Medicine Ontario and is the author of the hit book, Reclaim Your Energy and Feel Normal Again. Please tell your friends about the Functional Medicine Radio Show. And we'll see you next week with more from Dr. Carey.